All right, well, first, a huge thanks to our first sponsor, uh, GeoComfort Geothermal Systems. Help your clients live the net zero life um, with GeoComfort Geothermal, as well as our top tier, tier sponsor, Shrenergy, for both on the go and in your home, uh, solar connected and grid connected or off grid connected uh, battery systems. These systems uh, can be uh, with one or um, uh, up to five solar panels uh, connected together. And again, they can be used um, for camping, um, off the grid, or as a backup um, in the house for not um, uh, uh, if, but when the grid goes down. Here's some of the different charging times, two to 24 hours with solar, um, wall plug four to eight, car four to six, as well as some of the power outputs um, going up to uh, 33 hours for an 18 cubic foot Energy Star uh, certified fridge, and that's without any solar backup. Uh, on top of that, uh, Shrenergy has microgrid kits for your home, uh, small business or community project that you have going on to keep the juice running even, again, when the grid goes down and um, fully power a house or small business uh, through solar. All right, so very excited to be um, starting this session here on the uh, smart enclosure, enclosure system for the Anthropocene. Uh, this course is approved for one hour in continuing education units, AIA, AIBD, certified green professional, GBCI, and BPI. And AIA health, welfare, and safety may make it applicable to your state-based design or contractor license. Um, today I will be your moderator. My name is Brett Little and I'm the executive director here at the nonprofit The Green Home Institute. And the question and uh, conversation we're going to be having today is that with a changing climate, um, do we need to get better walls to respond and adapt? And how do we do it? Where do we go? Um, what kind of strategies can be used uh, to do that? Um, so I'm very excited to be um, presenting our or handing this off to our uh, speaker today, uh, Ken uh, Levinson. Uh, Ken is uh, the co-founder and uh, CEO of um, uh, 475 design and uh, or building supply rather. Uh, he's a registered architect in New York State since 1993, has a Bachelor of Architecture degree from Pratt Institute, uh, and is a certified Passive House designer and founding board member of the New York Passive House, the National Passive House Alliance, and the North American Passive House Network. Ken has served on advisory panels for Urban Green's 90 by 50 Advanced Policy Report and the Framework Guidelines for Energy Efficiency Standards and Buildings of the United Nations Economic Commission for Europe. When Ken is not thinking about Passive House or hanging out with, uh, he's hanging out with his wife and young daughters, he can usually be found walking their 80-pound uh, Newfoundland dog, uh, Romeo, in Prospect Park. So with that, Ken, uh, please take it away. Thank you, Brett. Uh, great to be here with you all. Um, and I, I wish it was an 80-pound dog. It's actually a 180-pound dog, uh, but um, it's great. So I'm very glad to be here with you all. I'm excited to talk today about a whole systems way of approaching making our building enclosures as we fast uh, approach deadline and pretty in place against climate change. At the end of my talk, I'm taking uh, as many questions as possible. So first, um, allow me to take a few minutes to introduce my company. Um, if you're not familiar with 475, we're a construction material supplier, but we're really about getting into and under the building science in support of high performance. People tend to want to work with us when they get into building science too, when they want to see how things are really Forming and when they're looking to provide more sustainable and less toxic solutions. We do a lot of analysis, whether by data collection, WOOFI analysis, or just looking at details and helping optimize them in terms of their performance and implementing those solutions. Road with us from the East Coast of West and Canada. It's about getting materials simply ordered and onto the job sites without hassle. So with no small plans um, at our outset, our founding mission was set to really help transform the industry and help move it toward higher performance. 
This realized meant as much about providing knowledge resources as providing building components. So we like to say 475 is a place where the blower door is king because air control is buildings. Everything grows out of air tightness. Without that, we really cannot have high performance building and have the predictability we want to have. And so we'll be uh, referring to air tightness a few times uh, in the talk here today. And while the old habits of industry point to spray foam as a high performance solution, 475 is a place where we see spray foam as more uh, a part of the problem than the solution. We know we can actually build more sustainably and robustly by limiting the amount of spray foam used. We know spray foam is not going away. We like to say less is best. And while most buildings may not be able to achieve passive house metrics at this time, we, we still see the clear and definitive goals and more predictable results of passive house as a guiding star for continual improvement. Our company was formed out of a passive house retrofit project in Brooklyn Heights and one in Westport, Connecticut. I was a practicing architect in Brooklyn, and my partner, Floris Keverling Boosman, was a Dutch trained architect and building science consultant who I worked with. In doing those early projects in 2009 and 2010, we saw a hole in the construction supply market for high performance knowledge and products. And so we took the leap. We both closed our respective businesses and set out to fill the market gap. So we were very fortunate that coming from a passive house background and looking at building from a more ecological perspective, we were able to partner with European suppliers who had been doing this sort of work for decades. Uh, who were doing this sort of work uh, for decades and were market leaders. Sorry, um, here and uh, like them, we're not trying to push product, but working with building science, putting the right product at the right location. Uh, we know we can build enclosures that are of the highest performance with safe, high quality materials, making them more resilient and more sustainable. So in starting the company, we knew we couldn't succeed in the typical fashion of a building supply company. We had no money. So we had to be an e-commerce company. We had to make a digital platform, a virtual home for high performance. Consequently, 475 is built as an e-commerce business where you can order products and arrange shipment directly online across the United States and Canada, even on your phone. Our, web our website is a source of diverse knowledge of not just specifications and installation instructions, but a videos, active building science blog, and growing construction detail libraries. Out of our backgrounds in architecture and design and construction and building science, we knew we wanted to provide really useful tools for professionals. So we developed, among other resources, a series of CAD details and eBooks, which can be downloaded, copied, and edited. Professionals can make them their own. So, that's a little bit about our company, and I'm very happy now to launch into the meat of the presentation. And I want to thank you all again for joining us today. Um, so as we noted, the passive house, uh, 475 started with Passive House, uh, and then we found components to build that, and we started to develop knowledge resources to put the components to work. At each step of our evolution, we're trying to bridge market gaps we perceived. Today, we see a yawning gap between science and professional practice, a gap between architecture and the urgency of this moment we find ourselves in the early 20th century, building in the Anthropocene era. And the smart enclosure system is our attempt to bridge that gap. I'll spend just a few slides on the background of these ideas, then a few on the framework of it, how we brought the smart enclosure, what the framework of the smart enclosure system, and finally, uh, some slides on the applications. I appreciate your time today to try to explain this to you. In the early 21st century, we find ourselves in a race against time. 
By 2050, we need to reduce carbon emissions by 80 to 90% globally to mitigate the worst effects of climate change. The decisions we make today will determine our success in 2050. Our goalposts have shifted and our buildings need to become a part of the solution, not perpetuate the problem. For thousands of years, buildings were made with a keen regard for nature and historically building science was intimately attuned to natural phenomenon. Then the 20th century builders with giant resources of energy and rapid scientific advancements tried to conquer the vagaries of nature. Natural solutions were ignored. If they felt like it, they made up, down, and down, up. And any, and any unintended consequences would be answered with yet more engineering and power. Conventional enclosures use too much energy and have too many toxins with too much plastics and too much stuff, too often out of step with nature and our current environmental predicament. So today, after 800,000 years of geologic history, we find ourselves in a very unusual place where we not only need to freeze greenhouse gas emissions, but should go back down and return to a stable and safe level of atmospheric carbon dioxide concentration of 350 parts per million. Action is needed. Most people we know in the building industry, the architects, consultants, and builders want to do the right thing. They want to figure it out. They want to contribute to the solution. The problem is when you go to the blackboard and look for the answers, it's really confusing and the clarity is lost. Traditionally, sustainability efforts have been in silos in some way or in kits of parts and in the active lives of professionals with all kinds of demands, who has time to reinvent the wheel and figure out how to do all the details and how does it all get combined back together with each other? The silos and parts and lack of time we think has led to, if not paralysis, at least a hesitation and a lack of confidence in moving forward. The smart enclosure system is our attempt at making systematic instructions that are accessible to architect, developer, and contractor, not unlike those for the Batmobile. We compare it to the time when the American with Disabilities Act passed. Architects and builders needed to comply, but they didn't necessarily need to know everything about it. They needed clear answers to address the problem. How high does the grab bar need to be? What do the push-pull uh, dimensions need to be around doors. They wanted technical guidance so they could concentrate on architectural design and construction. So we realized that we really needed, what we really needed were systematic instructions. We needed to return to the basics of building science. We needed to address operational and embodied energy, retrofit and new builds. And most importantly, we understood that the information provided needed to be actionable. So we're trying to put together as something uh, that you can just take and move forward with. Of course, any instructions need specific customization for specific projects or places, but there needs to be some sort of confidence moving forward. We hope this helps get one over the hurdle of hesitation. Smart enclosure system starts with the idea that in packaging the systems of things, in making a high performance object, it's really about the diversity of life on earth, of the species and of the people on the planet. And like Passive House, we really want to focus on the goals, the methodology, and the guideposts of the construction tasks at hand. It's really important this action is not about just doing less bad. As my childhood Episcopal priest told me, Ken, don't bother with guilt, guilt's a drag. What this is about is about helping fix systems and actively create a better future. What's required are smarter, more intentional choices that improve the environment. We think a smart enclosure system is a framework that makes those smart choices easier. 
The framework then is really a knowledge ecosystem. The ecosystem includes basic principles to set the stage, then tiers of performance as guideposts for applying the principles. And then we apply the tiers of performance to the assembly types, some more esoteric than others. Finally, a resource box, DWG files, picture libraries, videos to show construction, how to actually do the work at hand. We then input feedback and work to constantly improve the ecosystem. So we've got seven enclosure principles. There's no real magic to it. We really just worked to see how few we could get to, then expanded and contracted until we landed here. We just knew we needed to focus on lower embodied carbon, carbon sequestration, lowering the toxicity, more natural materials. We looked at smart vapor, air, and thermal control, 100-year durability, and fully integrated performance. The number of them is not so important. The important thing is that the more we realize these principles, the smarter the enclosure becomes. The enclosure is a complete system, a system whose intelligence is built into the structural fabric. Of course, there's going to be a certain amount of mechanical systems in any building, but they should play a secondary role. Smart qualities are not about tech gadgets that require rebooting, repairs, and worse. More like a Gothic cathedral, the smarts should passively reside in the architecture. The structure and enclosure should tell the story. To make high performance enclosures today, we don't need to reinvent the way we build. We need to focus on the fundamental principles to update typical details, standard specifications, and traditional means and methods. In our continuous paths of improvement, it's just a course correction to integrate new habits. So let's walk through the seven principles. They're not commandments by any stretch, but just organizing ideas, ideas for action. Passive House is great in terms of organizing and focusing on operational energy. Operational energy is so important and we should all be doing Passive House buildings. But in the time scale for 2050, which is essentially our civilization's deadline for reducing greenhouse gas emissions, we should understand that the most we should understand that most of the carbon is emitted by then, 80% in the making of the typical high performance building, not in operations, where only 20% will be contributed. The rub is that if you're doing passive house, embodied carbon is going to be an even greater amount relative to operational emissions. And if you're building a net zero building, then 100% of the emissions are embodied. Like compounding interest, embodied carbon avoided at the start of the building's life will have a greater beneficial effect than emissions saved at a later date. So that means we really need to dig in and figure out the embodied carbon if we're serious about 2030 and 2050 goals. Basic stuff becomes obvious when you start to look in that direction. Because the embodied carbon in the structure of a building can account for as much as half of the building's total carbon emissions, retrofits maximize a high performance building's immediate carbon savings. And so reuse and, reno and renovation of existing structures is by far the best thing we can do. Minimize waste using less materials. Source new materials that are using um, that are um, using less intensive processes um, and have a rehired, higher recycled content and use plant-based materials that have negative embodied carbon value. Let's look at one example. If you utilize wood board insulation that is sustainably harvested, it has a negative embodied carbon value that we see in relation to XPS, EPS, or mineral wool which are all positive. The multi-therm, which we are using in a stand-in for the different wood insulation products, is significantly negative. And really, the analogy that we use 
with this is to say, if there's a big event coming up and you want to lose a couple of pounds and you want to look your best, you start, you don't start eating bowls of pasta because you want to put your best foot forward to make it as easy as possible to reach your goal. So using materials that have negative embodied carbon are going to be a huge step to do that. At the right shows the progression. The gold bar here is negative, is the carbon sequestered in the wood product. Then we have a step up for the manufacturing, the energy used to make the product. The gray bar is after being shipped to a project on the East Coast, and then orange after shipping to a project site on the West Coast, so that we know that the product is getting to the job site in a carbon negative condition. So carbon capture we hear a lot of in the news today, and we hear of great scientific experiments at all levels, and some like burying CO2 in the ground appear to be very costly and risky propositions. What we haven't heard so much about is burying CO2 in the buildings and making the buildings and our cities huge carbon banks. Again, uh, through photosynthesis, the trees are cleaning the atmosphere and burying CO2 in themselves. Today, we see massive wood buildings going up 10, 20, 30 stories and bigger. So really anything is possible. The trick in putting the wood in the building is that it breaks the carbon cycle. The buildings lock in the carbon for the long term through 2100 and beyond. At the graph above, we see typical carbon emissions over the life of a wood product. The initial carbon emissions with planting, then during the life of the tree, it's like a sponge through photosynthesis, turning CO2 in the atmosphere into the wood product. And then we have a bump up in the manufacture and service life. And then depending on how we use that wood, uh, it can have very different trajectories. It must be said that there's a huge difference between traditional uh, commercial forestry and sustainable forestry. Um, sustainable forestry can limit emissions and promote biodiversity in the very act of the forest harvesting. The good news is that sustainable forestry is becoming more common and we need to the greatest extent possible be sure that we are using wood from sustainable forestry. At the lower right we see various levels of carbon emissions. The trick is to bend them down. Starting at the highest emissions we have new mainstream building. Then below it and better are new buildings with efficient construction and then net zero. But we can go further down. By retrofitting, we dramatically lower the embodied carbon and with Passive House, flatten the operational energy use, providing optimized impact. So with the carbon addressed, the next item is lower toxicity. The toxicity of construction materials and all sorts of things are a huge hazard, not just to occupants, but the workers on the job site and in the factories and for the biosphere itself. So we want to lower toxicity of what we're designing and building with from the Greenpeace plastics pyramid to the living building red list and declare labels, the precautionary list and the healthy building network Pharos project and more, we have the tools to make better choices. Natural materials can require minimal processing while providing substantial health benefits. As Michael Pollan might approvingly note, they are materials your ancestors would recognize. In that vein, straw bale wood frame can be counterintuitive when thinking of future forward materials, but it's a rapidly renewable material the straw sucking CO2 out of the atmosphere. Natural materials can be a healthier choice for indoor air quality, as they often help buffer humidity levels and when properly selected, have no VOCs. Source more natural materials such as wood fiber, wool, and cellulose insulations, timber structures, and lime plaster finishes. So the smart air vapor and thermal control is where the smart in the smart enclosure name comes from and provides passive house levels of energy efficiency 
comfort and durability with a robustness pr previously unavailable to the industry. Getting back to the basics of building science is the Building Science Corporation's perfect wall, calling out in the order of importance, bulk water, air tightness, vapor control, and insulation or thermal control. Long-term durability is critical for a positive environmental impact. The buildings must be built to last. And with that, people do get bulk water. Um, air control is second only to bulk water because it, affect, it affects fundamentally the performance of the building. Indoor air quality is counterintuitive. Perhaps a lot of people think of air tightness and enclosures and think, my gosh, it's going to be stuffy. What about the VOCs, all sorts of indoor pollutants? But the fundamental idea is that it's easier to control the quality of something when you actually have control of the thing. And the only way you can have control of the air is in an airtight environment. Once you have control of the air in an airtight environment, it takes very little energy to make it a very high quality. The leakier it is, the more energy it will take to assure quality. Drafts are uncomfortable, and air transported wetting is another encounter is another counterintuitive aspect. People think of a people uh, think of vapor control uh, when thinking about wetting, uh, but in terms of wetting damages, air leaks carry exponentially more moisture into an enclosure. Air tightness is really helpful in terms of preventing wetting. And of course, energy efficiency is the cornerstone of the passive house standard. A well-insulated building that's airtight versus leaky um, with the same insulation levels can have a five times difference in thermal performance. So you've really got totally different buildings just based on the tightness around that insulation. We like to say that the primary air barrier should be inboard of the insulation. This is cl a classic passive house diagram on the upper left showing the red line inboard of the main insulation as we have warm conditions, uh, warm condition air inboard and cool condensing surfaces outboard. We want to keep that conditioned air from coming into contact with the colder surfaces. And we also want to optimize the insulation. The problem is you can have all kinds of wind washing, degradating, degradation effects of the insulation. So we need to surround it with air tightness. It's one of those things in the knowledge resources that we're very careful to call out the primary air barrier inboard of the primary insulation layer in red and the secondary air barrier outboard of the primary insulation in blue. We want to be really clear about the differentiation. Inboard, we provide a smart vapor retarder and air barrier that is the tightest membrane system certified by the Passive House Institute. Outboard, our self-adhered vapor open membrane is so airtight that it tested to the limits of the lab equipment's capabilities. On the job site, air control continuity is where the rubber hits the road, particularly at those junctures where you have penetrations, windows, pipes, wires, joists, and joints between floor and walls and floors and roofs, etc. One thing we definitely recommend is a service cavity with battens to be able to run the wires and minimize the amount of penetrations through the air tightness layer. Without the continuity, you just don't end up with the needed air tightness. A couple of words on smart vapor control. Poorly insulated buildings heat themselves dry. A pretty sloppy building may have all kinds of leaks, um, but they also have heat leaks and the moisture is going to move through and dry out. A well insulated building stays cold, stays wet, and so the only way it's really going to dry is through vapor diffusion. We like the quote, stuff happens, so build a moisture tolerant design. So what smart vapor control does is help build this safety buffer. 
inboard the air barrier and smart vapor control layer prevent wetting in the winter season and opens in the summer season, allowing inward drying. By preventing wetting in the winter and encouraging drying in the summer, even with the roof preloaded with moisture as shown on the diagram on the lower right, it cycles through the seasons and dries out, building that safer safety buffer over time. In regions with winters, we want the outboard air barrier to be vapor open so the enclosures can dry outward too. We can maximize outward drawing further by not having sheathing outboard of the insulation. And here we see minimized uh, material use with sheathingless construction. We want the enclosure to have continuous thermal bridge free insulation. It's all basic building science, passive house stuff. At the upper left is an illustration of a thermal bridge and potentially condensing surface. Lower left, we show masonry construction with a big thermal bridge to the left, then a reduced thermal bridge by creating a collar of insulation in the middle, and then on the right, a thermal bridge-free connection condition where the wall is pulled away from the exterior, allowing for continuous insulation. Again, so much of this is basic building science. Other benefits of insulation can be thermal buffering, humidity buffering, and sound insulation. Here on the upper left, we see a graph showing a 70 degree swing uh, over time where the temperature, um, uh, you have the, the peak, um, uh, the, the, the peak in the heat at, um, uh, and, and 10 hours later, you have the peak uh, inboard um, of the insulation where you have a 70 degree difference outside. You only have a five and a half degree difference inboard. So this buffering of the uh, temperature helps carry the building through uh, swings uh, in, in, in the seasons in, in daily uh, weather without requiring uh, greater amounts of energy to overcome them. Uh, in the lower portion, we have uh, an experiment conducted in the desert that shows how the uh, wood insulation um, minimizes those swings and compared to XPS insulation. So again, by buffering the, the, the swings, um, we can maintain the most efficiency. 100 year durability. Wood buildings can last a long time. This is a 1300 year old wood building. It's possible most wood buildings built have a 50 year life expectancy, but there are many that are hundreds of years old or more. We want to build for the 100 year time frame. We want to again interrupt the carbon cycle by doing uh, what will maximize the effectiveness in the climate fight. And finally, integrated performance of the building. We all want our building to be an object of desire. If it's loved, it's more likely to be preserved. It should be beautiful and delightful. We should be hitting passive house performance. We may have ideas about permaculture, or other ideas uh, to bring to the table of sustainability uh, and good design. The enclosure needs to be fully integrated. The system is a framework to make that possible. So now let's take the principles and in looking to apply them uh, in the real world, we're going to use a framework of three tiers. The three tiers of the smart enclosure system are guideposts to help architects, engineers, consultants, um, builders better understand the general effectiveness of their efforts at making a more sustainable building. The three tiers are not precise demarcations of success, but indicate a general direction of improvement compared to each other and to typical industry approaches, which we describe, which for the typical industry approach, we describe as the standard high performance default solution. So starting from the industry default, the typical 
uh, and habits, if you will, that we're all accustomed to, we then have tier one where we look to modify the default. Tier two simplifies and improves upon it. And then tier three aims for an alter, uh, optimized performance capability. No doubt there's gonna be room for debate uh, about where things land and what choices um, precisely to be made in combinations, but the direction we need to go is clear. Uh, and so we can set out. We use common two by stick framing as the initial points of reference and then apply the basic principles across assembly types, adapting them as appropriate. So this is a typical high performance assembly with spray foam and board foam. It's high embodied carbon. It has very little to no carbon sequestration. Uh, it's high toxicity and less resilience in terms of maintaining high levels of moisture safety and, and air tightness over the life of the building. Tier one looks to modify common construction practice at a superficial level, yet fundamentally transform what it's capable of. Using two by framing with wood plywood sheathing, wood fiberboard and wood dense pack insulations, or wool loose fill insulation. Inboard an airtight smart vapor retarder with service cavity and outboard airtight and vapor open weather resistant barrier or wind tight wood fiber board with a back vented rain screen. These simple shifts from plastic, from plastic insulations to wood and or wool with systematic air tightness and vapor control drastically change the performance in all categories, creating a healthier, more durable, carbon negative enclosure that directly addresses the needs of our climate at the outset and for the life of the building. Admittedly, um, I'm throwing out a lot of information fast and I apologize. Please have a look at our website to examine all these uh, details and assembly types at your own pace. In tier two, uh, what we would consider an improvement is then going sheathingless. The sheathing really isn't needed. Sheathing is a historic artifact based on habit and tradition. With diagonal bracing, the wood insulation board can act as a WRB in outboard wind tight layer. For temporary weather protection, you can wrap the framing in an airtight WRB before applying the insulation board. The inboard air and vapor control and outboard back vented rain screen are similar to tier one. Tier two removes not only the sheathing material, but also the labor associated with installing it and makes the assembly even more robust, healthy, and resilient. Tier three further reduces layers and complexity while providing greater future flexibility and in so doing makes it still more robust. This approach is a direct descendant of the persist enclosure developed by the National Research Council Canada. Like tier two, it has no sheathing and now the wood fiber board insulation is moved entirely outboard of the framing with a back vented rain screen exterior finish. Before installing the wood fiber board insulation, be sure to install an airtight smart vapor retarder WRB. This can be the simplest, lowest carbon, most robust, and healthiest assembly. So the assemblies. So armed with the principles, seven principles and the three tiers framework, we look to apply them to the assemblies. We start with retrofits and then new build. We cover higher performance wood construction and we'll cover how to make the most of metal and concrete construction types. Today we have published the first three assembly systems and in eBooks and plan to release iJoyce Outrigger uh, eBook momentarily. Then in February, we'll be double stud and on down. One each month is the plan. Each assembly eBook has comprehensive details, illustrations and text with links to photo libraries and videos to help you take action and implement the framework we are describing today. If possible, choose renovation before new build because it's the smartest form of construction. 
renovating and reoccupying old buildings is rightly considered an act of sustainability in itself. Using the existing structure can mean 50 to 75% less embodied carbon on day one of occupancy than a new building would generate. The vast majority of the buildings that will exist in 2050 already exist today. Yet to fully bring these buildings into the 21st century, they need to also be made as operationally energy efficient and as comfortable as possible to help mitigate climate change. We can do this safely and robustly, and therefore historic buildings shouldn't be exempt from aggressively addressing efficiency. But obviously we can't always retrofit. There's going to be a lot of new construction. Basically, what we're doing is looking at the assemblies that we see are very common in the high performance and passive house community. Two by wood framing, eye joist outriggers, and the double stud. So you increase the sequestration now and maximize the carbon impact. Mass timber is a very exciting and fast emerging option in the North American construction scene. Mass, mass timber has many performance benefits, including fire resistance, acoustic performance, material stability, and construction efficiency. The mass timber smart enclosure complements the mass timber structure with wood fiber insulation, maximizing carbon sequestration and negative carbon potential. And while straw bale would seem to be an anachronistic choice at first glance, we should look closer. With an uncommon approach, straw bale may be the most effective carbon sink available to construction professionals today. Because straw is a rapidly renewable resource that is full of carbon drawn from the atmosphere, it can be even more effective than wood in our climate mitigation efforts. And straw bale, which I mentioned earlier, is a rapidly renewable resource. So it seems like an important leader to put out there in terms of what's possible, even if it's not very common. Metal is problematic because it typically has high embodied energy and doesn't sequester carbon. However, metal can and should have high levels of recycled content. And the fact is, metal framing isn't going away anytime soon. Consequently, we want to make these assemblies as smart as possible by limiting other materials with large embodied energy like foam plastic insulation, making the enclosure more durable and operationally efficient for 100 years and more. Maximize the use of wood and other natural materials and the overall design strategy of these metal and concrete buildings. While there are many variables at play with concrete, it is often worse than metal because the embodied carbon of concrete and particularly Portland cement is just so damn high. Like metal, it's not going away and there are a number of things we can do to make it a smarter option. So we're building growing resources uh, around this framework. The ebooks, as I mentioned, with architectural details and illustrations with explanatory texts are available. The DWGs coupled with photo galleries and videos. Um, we're really looking at real world job site conditions and what works for professionals. We're looking forward to growing these resources and getting feedback and involving the information. So there's no time left in the countdown to zero. We're down to one. This is it. Zero is coming any moment now. So let's take action. Let's build like the future depends on it. Thank you very much for your time. And I look forward to answering questions. Thank you. Hey, great. Thanks, Ken. Yeah, we, uh, we got a lot of questions rolling in here. And, <laughs> okay. Um, yeah, before we before we get to those questions, though, just uh, uh, real quick, um, I want to thank all of you for joining us. Um, thanks to our board of directors, all of our volunteers um, to allow us to do what we do. Thanks to our top tier sponsors, Shrinergy for on the go or in your house uh, microgrid backup solar solutions, uh, T Stud for structurally insulated 
framing systems that uh, work and save money behind the walls, and Mitsubishi Electric to getting to high performance net zero homes uh, using air source heat pumps that are ducted and ductless. Um, so yeah, with that, uh, some questions are rolling in. Uh, one of them specific to um, earthquakes, and that is, you know, the claim is that uh, sheathing is used to prevent structural damage from earthquakes. So the question is, is diagonal brace sufficient to prevent earthquake damage? And then on top of that, can you just, you know, reiterate why, um, you know, why you'd want to get rid of sheathing? Sure. So I, I guess the, um, the answer to the earthquake question is an uh, unsatisfactory non-answer, but that, um, you know, it's going to depend. And you need to talk to a structural engineer who's familiar with the local requirements. Uh, but um, I don't have a background in personally in earthquake um, areas, uh, strong earthquake areas, but we do have earthquakes in New York um, and uh, in many parts of the country. Uh, and my sense is that the brace, cross bracing will work. It's just a matter of the engineering, the fastening, and um, you know what the, what the connections look like specifically. Um, so the sheathing again is 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 in in some ways just uh, out of uh, out of habit and tradition. Um, the, to eliminate the sheathing, why we want to do it simply because um, you really don't need all that material uh, typically to provide the structural stability for the building and to have a safe and and long lasting building. So that's a lot of material that can be taken out of the construction. Um, so money can be saved with the material and money can be saved also with the labor involved in installing it. So it helps uh, build in toward the affordability of it. And in, from a building science perspective, the, the sheathing can be uh, quite um, pronounced vapor retarders and depending on the, the construction. Um, so uh, oftentimes when we're looking to have the most vapor open assemblies possible for outward drawing, um, that can be counterproductive. So there are a number of reasons. Again, it's going to uh, need to respond to specific uh, conditions, but um, th that's the basic outline. Um, could you address, or do you have any thoughts on, um, you know, straw clay insulation, hemp insulation, hemp creek? Yeah. And then on top of that, can you, you know, just discuss again? Um, there are a lot of concerns with this and straw bale and wood insulation about moisture and rot and, and rodents. Sure. Um, tell you what I can. Um, so we're uh, fans of hempcrete as well and hemp in general. It's good to see the production of it being legalized in parts of the country and um, and hope that uh, it really picks up. It's It's been long overdue. And um, yeah, I think part of the idea is to add hemp uh, in with the straw bale um, uh, as well. Uh, did a workshop upstate New York um, a couple of years ago with hempcrete um, and uh, it was really uh, fascinated by it and think it has uh, big potential. Um, in terms of longevity and, you know, rodents and other things, um, my sense is that it, it, they are no more or less um, uh, uh, prone uh, to such damages than other um, traditional construction types and, and maybe less so. I think it depends on how you're treating the de ground uh, condition um, and the detailing around with it. I will admit that when we move to the straw bale, it's what we're the least familiar with. We're starting with the eye joist outriggers, two by framing um, and double stud, which are very common in passive house. For the straw bale, uh, we're going to be looking to experts in straw bale construction. We're very fortunate to have some leading uh, customers in, uh, in Vermont who have done high performance straw bale construction uh, with our components and, um, and look forward to learning from them. And hopefully with that ebook, we'll have a full uh, greater explanation on, the, on those concerns. Do you, do you have any genuine or general thoughts on uh, uh, straw clay being interchangeable with straw bale? Um, I don't. I honestly don't know enough about it. But it certainly seems like uh, 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 interesting and intriguing, and, um, 
uh, approach and and why not if if it works and it will last and you know, the other thing to say about straw bale is I know that there are uh, many examples of, of straw bale houses that may be 80 80 years old or more um, so uh, have to build it right right um, does uh, when you say mass timber do you mean timber frame uh, mass timber like uh, CLT um, mass timber where they're um, basically cross laminated um, uh, framing um, and you're using solid wood planking for the walls and the floors and and built up wood beams for the, the, the floor the floor beams as well as uh, columns um, does the exterior wood fiber insulation have an integrated WRB or is that an added layer no it's integrated um, it, it, depending on the exact product that you pick, um, but we, there are products that are meant to be um, the wood continuous wood board insulation as well as the WRB. There's uh, some paraffin in the mix, and um, they're beveled and the the constructed in a certain way to uh, allow proper drainage. So behind a back vented rain screen, um, they work exceptionally well. Um, so on the tier three wall assembly you were talking about outboard wood insulation, what about length of fasteners and those penetrations? Sure. I mean, uh, one th they can get quite thick and the, and the, and the fasteners can get uh, pretty hefty. Um, there are point connections through the wood uh, to wood, so the thermal bridging effects of it are minimal. Um, and structurally, again, things need to be calculated at the end of the day the, by the weight and also the weight of the siding that's going over it. If you're hold, you know, uh, heaven forbid you're hanging a stone facade over the <laughs> over the insulation, you're going to need one set of calculations versus typical wood siding. Um, but that's pretty pretty well thought through. I mean, the, this sort of uh, construction has been commonplace in Europe for for quite some time. Yeah, there was actually a secondary comment here of someone saying sheathing is rarely used in Europe. So, um, yep. backing you up there. Uh, so another question is: Can you explain the outward drying of a roof assembly uh, in a? I believe they're saying in a temperate climate, wouldn't vapor dry from a warm roof push moisture in? Yes, and you want it to be able to dry inward is the is the issue. So, um, what's happened in the past is people have installed. Uh, vapor barriers, you know, the polyethylene plastic is part of creating an air barrier to get efficiency. Uh, but that vapor barrier, um, if there is moisture in the roof assembly and you have the heat uh, driven moisture, it's it's pushing and wants to dry inward. But if you have a vapor barrier inboard, it um, prevents that. So with smart uh, vapor uh, control layers, that actually has variability to its vapor profile and, and allows that drying inward. When the humidity level rises to dangerous levels or towards dangerous levels, um, it opens up and allows drying to occur. Does that answer? Uh, you know, if it, if it doesn't, I certainly invite them to um, uh, respond back. So um, there's several more questions here. Do you have experience with natural under slab insulation system? Obviously, uh, mineral wool seems to be coming a long way with that. But b beyond that, do you do you have any other ideas? Uh, yeah. Well, uh, two things that we uh, approach it with: um, if we want to use wood fiber insulation, we actually go on top of the slab um, and have that continuous insulation from from the interior of the the, the ground slab. Uh, then below, yeah, mineral wool has become more and more commonplace in terms of uh, as a foam replacement below slab. Uh, we're also very excited, though, about foam glass gravel, uh, which is made, which is an insulation, it's a granular insulation made from recycled glass. Uh, it's blown uh, very high temperature, um, and uh, it provides drainage as well as insulation. So it's a two for one. Uh, 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 benefits um, from it and 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 simplifying the construction process in that way. 
So are you, you're seeing a lot of projects use the the wood board on top of the slab. There's no issue. Uh, we're there. we're seeing uh, more projects do it, and we're seeing um, foam glass gravel is also very um, and the and the wood board on top of the slab, both are very common in Europe. Um, and uh, so we are seeing the start of uptake here, but again, it's um, one step at a time. But there's nothing inherently wrong with it. It's just a little experience. Um, are you aware of any other methods used for cross bracing in a sheathingless design besides metal strapping? So, for example, aircraft cable or et cetera? I've not seen aircraft cable. We've seen uh, lead in wood. Um, would cross bracing basically taking two by four material and 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 um, and uh, letting it into the the stud that it's bracing so it's flush outboard. Um, does any of the wood board insulation products provide shear resistance like plywood? Not the wood insulation board, no. Um, do you know of any uh, CSA or Canadian approved exterior wood fiber insulation boards with an integrated WRB? Um, well, I know um, the boards that we are providing have been used in the Canadian market extensively, and I would have to look up what the exact um, tests we have done on it. But we've actually worked with FP Innovations in Canada, and um, have a number of um, pilot projects with them um, uh, coming online, um, which are super exciting. So I don't think there's any inherent uh, prohibition against using it. Um, going back to the uh, slab, there was a comment about uh, condensate forming between the insulation and the slab in regards to using wood fiber. Is there? I mean, is that a concern, or is that um, an easy way to design that out? Yeah, I mean, it's going to be a combination of things. The interior uh, humidity levels, I mean, if it's a sauna or a swimming pool, we would not advise it, <laughs> um, probably. Uh, we want to make sure that we have vapor control inboard of the insulation. Um, that could be with um, subfloor, you know, sheathing on top of the, the wood insulation. It could be uh, a membrane. Um, depending on what the floor buildup is going to be. Um, and uh, we want to make sure we have a good vapor barrier outboard and uh, drainage below the slab. Um, it's not necessarily unlike a wall in, in terms of the dynamics, but it is, um, you know, I guess a bit more sensitive. So we want sure. to make sure yeah, it's done right. Um, so there was some concern. Uh, or questions really about how thick these wall uh, systems you're recommending are getting, especially when it comes to renovation. Can you address that? Sure. I mean, what we see in our wood retrofit book um, that we've we've published, um, you know, you can go either two ways. You can um, essentially do a pretty modest insulation job, uh, keeping the exterior, you know, a lot of uh, this historic buildings, you can't touch the exterior of the wood building um, or other than putting it back as it was. Um, so you're insulating in the existing studs. You're not getting that high insulation level, uh, but you are removing the interior finishes and making it airtight, making it um, the vapor profile as strong as possible and eliminating hopefully as many thermal bridges as you can. Um, uh, if you're allowed to go on the exterior, which often is the case, um, you know, you have the option of preserving the interior. Um, you don't necessarily need to remove it. What we see is, you know, you're removing the siding, um, the existing siding and wrapping the building with a membrane, um, typically a smart vapor retarder, WRB. Um, that provides that um, high performance control and then adding the board insulation on top of that, fastening it back to the existing stud structure and then adding a, a back vented rain screen on top of that. There, you're changing the look of the building and depending on the design and the sight lines, you may need to cut off the eaves and replace you know, certain things so it's aesthetically works. Um, certainly we've seen projects where people won't insulate as much because aesthetically it's just not um, suitable. Um, so a lot of different considerations, but there's generally see in these um, uh, 
you know, wood frame constructions that they could they could handle structurally a lot of insulation on the outside. It's just really much more a matter of the detailing and how you tie it all back together. Again, the windows too, you pop those out and move the windows, can sit proud of the existing framing um, and deal with the, you know, the design, the shadow lines, the profiles, the look. Great, thank you. Um, and another real specific question, are you using metal screws through exterior insulation board or a thermally broken product? Is a thermally uh, broken fastener even necessary? Yeah, no, it typically it's just metal um, uh, insulation screws that the point, uh, point to point, and typically we're going into wood structure. Um, and uh, so the thermal bridging is um, not zero, but uh, de minimis, I guess. Well, uh, great. I, you know, we're at our time now. I, I do not see any other questions. This has certainly been a lot of information. So on that note, Ken, where can people um, you know, get more information if they want to learn more and, um, or contact yeah. you? Yeah. Great. Um, thank you so much, uh, Brett, and, and to the Green Home Institute for this opportunity. Um, please uh, come to our website, which is www.475.com. Uh, or .ca if you're in Canada. And if you happen to be in Quebec, it will come up as a French language um, website. Uh, the 475 is spelled out, F-O-U-R-S-E-V-E-N-F-I-V-E. -E -E. So we hope you come and check it out. There's a lot of stuff to, uh, to dive into. All right, well, huge thanks to you, Ken uh, Levinson and the 475 High Performance Building Supply for taking your time out today. Thanks to you all for joining us. If you're looking to get your Con Ed, remember to take that survey at the end. And if you're listening to this on demand, make sure to take your 10 question quiz with an 80% passing rate. Uh, take care, everyone. Have a great week. Thank you. Great. Thanks so much. Bye-bye.